All right, hi everyone. Thank you for coming to see me talk today about how Netflix provisions um, optimal cloud deployments um, of Cassandra. Although all the all the systems that we'll be talking about today um, actually are generic to any data store. Um, so let's get started. All right. So who am I? I'm Joey. If you haven't met me before, I work at Netflix on the cloud data engineering team. Uh, I shepherd databases and sometimes wrangle data. Um, if you're uh, some various projects I've worked on. And today, uh, we'll be talking about um, something that I'm very excited I get to share with you all, uh, which is the Netflix Service Capacity Modeling um, Open Source Project, uh, which is a toolkit for modeling capacity requirements in the, in the cloud. And we'll, use, we'll talk today about how we can use uh, this to, to model Cassandra. All right. So what are we going to cover today? We're going to cover three main areas. The first one is we're going to cover how we have to kind of understand our hardware in order to capacity plan them. Then once we've kind of uh, made a description of hardware, we can then uh, get into how we'll use that description combined with the user requirement language uh, to plan Cassandra clusters uh, with a little bit of light touch into capacity, uh, capacity modeling and uh, queuing theory there. And then finally, we'll just cover how we would monitor if we made the right choice. Um, so in today's talk, we'll be talking about kind of taking uncertain user uh, requirements, and then what cluster should we buy? Um, but that's a, a separate question from over time as we discover what the user is actually doing, um, did we buy the right things? So I'll just touch on that real quick at the end. Um, and kind of at a high level, we'll be solving this equation all day long. So we have some workload capacity model. We feed into that model a desire, so what the user wants. Um, we give it some context around hardware, like what kind of computers can we buy and for how much money, and life cycle. Uh, pricing and life cycle that uh, might come from your company. Uh, we'll cover that in a second. And then the output of this model will be a candidate cluster, something that we can actually go provision Cassandra on. To, to understand uh, hardware, we have to take a step back and look at all the computers we can buy, um, because it turns out there are lots of them. Uh, I'm curious how many people out there uh, have gone to their cloud uh, vendor page and they have found out that their hardware uh, page looks something like this, where there are like hundreds of different choices. You can get um, all kinds of different flavors. Some have memory, some have disks, some have CPUs. Um, I've just happened to pick out uh, the EC2 instances page here. Uh, but this, this is really problematic because we can't fill in this equation if we don't actually understand our hardware. Um, and furthermore, we, we, we need to have an indication of whether or not that's hardware that we should ever deploy on, um, which, which we call it Netflix lifecycle. But furthermore, even if you zoom in on one instance, like on one type of hardware, and you look at uh, that hardware, uh, most of the information you have is not entirely accurate. Um, so for example, it's very common for cloud providers to, um, to advertise in base 10 uh, when you probably care about base 2. So like that 32 GIB is actually 32 GB. Um, and when you're buying large amounts of hardware to run Cassandra on, which uh, you know what the actual numbers are matter. Like you know, if if we think that we have 300 gigs of disk and we don't actually have 300 gigs of disk, we're going to have a bad day when we try to rely on that. But furthermore, the pricing information is all over the place. Like each company negotiates different pricing, and uh, not to mention that uh, depending on how like whether you buy one year reser reservations or three year reservations or two year reservations or or partial upfront, all these numbers are different. And it's really quite difficult for a human to kind of keep track of all this. Like there's all those different kinds of computers and they cost different amounts and the prices are changing all the time. So we're really kind of faced with this problem of we don't have accurate hardware profiles and we don't know um, any specific pricing or lifecycle information. Um, like there's, that's not really available anywhere. So maybe the solution is that we should just find the instance type lab label database and, and we just buy that. So like, you know, go go to the page and search for DB and and just launch some of those. Maybe that'll work. Or maybe if we don't want to do that, we just search for conference talks by some, you know, user of the database and just use whatever they use. Uh, I think we can do better. I think we can actually analyze our hardware. And uh, today we'll see how to do that. So the first part is we have to break down our hardware into four kind of components. So we need to look at capacity. So how much of those different computing resources do we have? Latency, so how good are those computing, computing resources? Not all cores are created equal. Not all NICs are created equal. Um, and then we have to kind of layer on these two additional things that your company has to bring. And when we designed the open source library, we actually built it so that you can layer on your company's pricing and your company's lifecycle. 
Um, the top two we can measure, and the bottom two, uh, you know, is really something that you have to bring and compose on top of. Um, so to try to explain lifecycle, uh, I think you can kind of just explain it with a couple of questions, like like would friends let friends launch, you know, EC2 M3 instances, like you know, like no, they, like you you should never ever pay Amazon for M3 instances because there are better choices. There are M4s and M5s, specifically M5s are like strictly dominant to M3s, and M5Ds are are also. Um, there's going to be alphabet soup during this talk because Amazon uh, names their instances with alphabet soup. Uh, if at any time, just uh, for the sake of this this slide, M3s are a very old instance type. They're running a very old processor. We really shouldn't have to launch on them. But furthermore, your company also has specific lifecycle because maybe your particular software stack doesn't work well on ARM64 architectures. So um, how do we deal with that at Netflix? Uh, well, at Netflix, for every type of hardware, we actually classify it into five distinct life cycles. Um, and I've given some examples here. So alpha is just you know straight up uh, adventurous people might want to launch on this. Uh, beta and stable are what we use for the most part. And then deprecated is used to signal the capacity planners to stop uh, recommending that particular type of instance type. Um, but also we can we can dive in and we can actually know uh, what kinds of computers actually exist and we can measure their performance and then we can layer on that pricing and lifecycle information. So you might ask like, well, how do we measure that? How do I actually get those numbers? Um, at Netflix, we, we do this by generating load and then we just measure. Um, so for every type of hardware, we uh, generate synthetic benchmarks, and then we we measure what what happens. Um, so for example, and this is linked at the bottom to the to the open source project, <clears throat> uh, you can actually just read uh, from your database, and then you can measure uh, how fast the disk IOs are. So in this case, we have an M5D that's running Cassandra, and it's got a normal read read load going against it, and we can just construct this distribution of how fast an M5D hard drive is. Um, and it turns out you can do this for any drive in the cloud. So uh, we've actually done that at Netflix for various cloud drives. Uh, here I've shown two, um, two different distributions. The top one is for an M5D ephemeral drive, uh, and the bottom one is for uh, EBS GP2, which is um, network attached uh, SSD storage. And I just want to you know t uh, call, call into two things here. So the orange boxes are real data. Um, that's real data that's been um, that's been collected from drives using BioSnoop. And then this blue and black and, and black line is a statistical model of that data. So we're fitting we're fitting a beta distribution um, to to that data, and and this will come in handy later um, because you need to you need to know you need to have like a generative distribution in order to reason about these drives. Um, but yeah, so so if you uh, go back to that open source link that I sent earlier, uh, you can actually calculate this for any drive. You can characterize your own drives and then and then generate these kind of summary statistics that that yield a distribution. Um, and you know, network and 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 uh, CPU are all similarly easy to measure. You can just fire up an iperf run. In Netflix, we use netperf, uh, netperf, um, but iperf works just as well. And the only kind of gotcha is that uh, cloud vendors often have burst capacity um, because it, that's actually very useful. But when you're doing capacity planning, um, you don't want a capacity plan with the burst throughput. So this is an example where we ran a network test, and you can see for the first kind of ten minutes, we got ten gigabits. But then after um, or sorry, after 20 minutes, we, it drops down to about two gigabits. So when we're doing capacity planning, um, you want a capacity plan with the eventual baseline throughput, not the first throughput. Otherwise, you're going to be sad. Um, but if this all sounds hard, don't worry. Uh, Netflix has, has done this for a bunch of instances, and, and we've actually included uh, real information about, in, about hardware uh, in our open source project um, across a, a multitude of different instance shapes and types. And you can see here that we have the actual count, the actual frequency of those CPUs, um, how much RAM they actually have, how much uh, network they actually have, how much disk they actually have, and the latency distributions of those disks, <clears throat> including whether or not those disks are shared across VMs. So for example, if you have an extremely latency sensitive data store, you might, want to, not, might not want to provision on uh, multi-tenant drives. But then you can actually, uh, in the same repo, you can see how we layer on pricing. Um, so this is the three-year reserve pricing on Amazon. Um, and and you can bring your own pricing and then just apply it to the existing shapes. Uh, and then finally, uh, you can actually, along with that pricing, include life cycle. So here we've we've dubbed you know M5D two X larges as stable, and we've you know dubbed R five Ns as alpha. So uh, you know, but this is obviously up to each company. So um, when we designed this library, we designed it with the notion that uh, every user gets to bring their own pricing and their own life cycle. All right, so now we have a good understanding of hardware uh, and pricing and lifecycle, but we still haven't talked about like, well, how do we even write down what a user wants? Because 
uh, we need a language for talking about those requirements in order to capacity plan. And you might say, well, the user probably knows how much CPU, RAM, network, and disk they actually need. Um, this is what I call the Kubernetes model, where it's like, well, like you know, picking instance types is hard, but if we just give them the number of CPUs, then they'll magically know how to provision things. And it's like, well, no, they actually probably don't know this information. I probably don't know this information. Um, then you might say, well, they might know how much traffic they're going to send and how big their data is. And at least at Netflix, uh, they probably don't know that either, right? They're probably building some feature that's new. They don't really know um, what's what's going to be generated from that. Uh, so we kind of are left with like, we'll never know the truth, and we should, you know, just, you know, what are we what are we to do? Um, well, the key insight that we had at Netflix was that they they don't know exactly how much traffic they're going to send, um, but they do have an idea of the order of magnitude. Um, so they generally know if they're talking about, you know, ten thousand per second or. 100,000 per second, or if they're talking about gigabytes, or if they're talking about petabytes. So if we can help them phrase their inputs in terms of intervals, so instead of uh, them saying, I need 10,000 requests per second, they say things like, I, I will need between uh, 1,000 and 100,000, and my expected value is 10,000. Um, and then we can use some statistics to fit uh, generative beta distributions to those inputs. So here I've just you know, shown uh, four examples of different beta distributions, which all have the same ranges, but uh, we're just kind of moving that expected value around. Um, and you can see how users can express really kind of like uh, sophisticated inputs this way uh, without giving us exact numbers. So uh, in Netflix, they just say order of magnitude, 10,000 requests per second, order of magnitude, 100 gigabytes. And then we actually take those uh, those those intervals, and we're going to use them to describe every aspect of a user uh, input. And um, I know that uh, for the next couple of slides, we're going to have a little bit of walls of text here. I promise you that if you're uh, you can just go look at the code uh, I've linked at the bottom if you're curious exactly what each which each input is. Um, but uh, at the top level, I just want to zoom in on this first uh, input, which is the service tier. And at uh, Netflix, we we use this one number to represent a lot of critical context about um, capacity planning, uh, namely how sad are you if this cluster fails. Um, so at Netflix, tier zeros are uh, extremely critical, and we would rather over provision. We'd rather spend a lot of money, um, anything, so that we don't have outages in those clusters. Uh, compare this to like tier ones. Um, broadly speaking, tier zero and tier one is like production, uh, and broadly speaking, tier two and tier three is like testing. Um, but the reason why we, we we separate those is because sometimes you have production clusters which are like experimental, and sometimes you have testing clusters which are critical. Um, so rather than tying them to deployment areas, we just have the single number, uh, and, and we try to we try to uh, use this to to express a lot of context around uh, how important something is, and we'll, and we'll see how this comes into effect later when we're when we're provisioning out hardware. Um, but the the second main component of the input is going to be the query pattern. So I forget the wall. The, the only thing that uh, I want I want to get out of the wall of text on the left is every single input the user gives us here is going to be an interval. So they're not giving us the actual values; they're giving us the range of values. Um, and here we're trying to capture like how are you going to query this data store? Are you going to be reading? Are you going to be writing? Are you going to be requiring a sub one millisecond latency SLO or a ten millisecond latency SLO? Um, and a key insight that we'll, we'll uh, see here is this is a lot of inputs. So we can't ask the user to provide all of these. And what we found is that the person who writes that model function is actually much better equipped to know things like what kind of, um, you know, what's the average read, read size or what's the average write size or how long on CPU does it take to read or write. And the same thing is true for the data shape, uh, which is kind of like how it, how does the footprint look? What kind of compression ratios are we going to expect to get? Um, and again, a key insight is that users probably don't know this, but uh, the person deploying Cassandra does know, for example, how much heap memory we're going to give Cassandra, or they know how much memory we have to reserve for the kernel. Um, so, so the you know these these look like a lot of inputs, but uh, in practice, the user typically only gives us three. Um, so uh, this is an example of an input a user might give. They, they, they're not exactly sure how much QPS they'll do, but it'll be between 1,000 and 100,000, and they're expecting 10,000. Um, so 10,000 reads, 10,000 writes, and then 100 gigabytes of state <clears throat> on order. And then uh, from, from that input, we can generate all of these different distributions for all of those inputs that we went over. Uh, and the green ones here are the ones that the user gave us. So the user gave us the 10,000 reads, the 10,000 writes, and the 100 gigabytes of data. 
Um, and then the model author, the, the programmer who wrote the Cassandra capacity model, they were like, well, Cassandra on average gets compression ratios around 2.7, 2.8, because that's what LC4 gets. Um, on average, our reads are around a kilobyte and our writes are around 128 bytes. And so like all of these distributions, the red ones, they came from um, the uh, from the author of the model. And uh, those graphs are a little hard to see, so I just wanted to kind of zoom in um, and, and just label these a little bit better. So uh, at the top here, we've got um, a distribution that represents the number of reads per second, uh, how large those reads are, how many writes, how large those writes are, um, how large the data size is, how much compression we're going to be getting on that data, and then how much time on CPU a read or a write operation consumes on our, on our hardware. Um, and an important thing to call out about like these red ones is you don't actually have to be right. You just have to be within a close order of magnitude. Um, so for example, uh, Cassandra spends more time on CPU fulfilling a read than uh, a, a memcache data store does because memcache does fewer things on CPU. So if you're, um, if you're trying to figure out how to get these numbers, um, we measure them uh, just by metrics that we have on the data store. But uh, you can also just kind of be within an order of magnitude and it'll probably work out okay. All right, so now we've seen how we can construct these, these uh, you know, multitude of inputs from a relatively small number of uh, user desires. Uh, now let's dive into how we use those desires in our hardware in order to compute clusters. <clears throat> and this is what I was talking about earlier about like the model author. So this is, this is what the, the capacity planner uh, model author is, is contributing. Um, so we've got these uncertain requirements and we need to buy computers. How do we do that? Uh, well, we need the right inputs. Check. We just we just we have the right inputs now, um, and we're going to need some math. Um, but I promise, I promise, it's it's straightforward math. It's just we're just going to be multiplying some numbers together. It's not it's not scary. We'll walk we'll, we'll work through it. Um, and to make it a little bit easier, we're going to forget about those distributions. Um, so we're just going to assume that we know uh, the writes per second, the reads per second, how big those are. And we're going to try to, for a given input, compute what kind of hardware we should go buy. And in the Gussie Planner library, we um, represent this interface with a single function, which takes um, a concrete type of hardware. So this, this would be a particular shape of computer. Um, this would be a particular cloud drive that we can attach in case this one doesn't have any drives. Um, and then the desires, the capacity desires, is, are, is that combination of service tier, query pattern, and data shape. And then uh, this function's job is to return uh, whether or not we can make a cluster out of that. So the reason that it's optional and it can sometimes be none is because imagine that they ask for like a million requests per second. Uh, there's no there's no way that we can we can do that with like an M5 large or whatever. So as a result, we would return none. There's no there's no capacity. Um, excuse me. There's no cluster which satisfies those requirements uh, for that particular type of instance type. All right, so let's get down to the nitty gritty. Let's figure out how do we actually figure out how many CPUs, how much RAM, and how much disk we need. Um, CPU is uh, pretty straightforward. We just use uh, square root staffing. So we uh, take the average amount of CPU time per request. We multiply that by the average number of requests per second. Um, and then we add that to uh, some quality of service parameter multiplied by the square root of that product. And uh, I've pre-computed here a couple of values that, that we use at Netflix. And you can think of the queue parameter as what's the probability that a request shows up in my Cassandra cluster and must queue behind another request that is executing on CPU. Um, so for And this is where those tiers come in because we're, we're going to uh, pay extra money. So we're going to buy extra cores for tier zero such that the probability of a request showing up in queuing is close to zero. Um, and that corresponds to a Q factor of 2.375. Um, and if you're curious exactly like how we generate this table, uh, there's a wonderful uh, resource on queuing theory called Performance Modeling and Design of Computer Systems uh, that explains all about this. Um, but I promise, it, while it looks complicated in the textbook, it's just multiplying you know, two numbers together. Uh, in this case, three numbers, right? So we've got the CPU time per request, the request per second, and the Q factor. <clears throat> And going back to those inputs that we captured from the user, we have all those numbers. We have how many reads per second it's going to be, and we know how long those reads and writes are going to take on CPU. And for example, like uh, we can actually adjust for if they're doing like uh, single data center writes or, glo or global writes, we can make the on CPU cost of a write uh, more or less expensive. <clears throat> All right, so we see how to do square root staffing of CPUs. How about network? Um, at Netflix, we, we find that Cassandra is not usually network bandwidth uh, limited. So um, we don't use a complex model for network bandwidth. For something like uh, Memcache, 
uh, where it's relatively memcached or Redis, where you can saturate an arc link uh, re reasonably easily, or maybe Cassandra 4 um, with the new um, with the new Netty uh, networking system, uh, you might have to move to this complex model, but we just use a simple model. So we take the number of reads per second and the average number of bytes per read and the number of writes per second and the average number of um, bytes per write, uh, and we just multiply those together. And uh, I've included some kind of fudge factor K here. Um, at Netflix, we try to reserve about 50% of our bandwidth for backup activities. Um, and repair activities. So, so we, we use a fudge factor of, of two here. Um, it's really not a fudge factor. It's really more of like how much extra capacity on your NIC do you want to reserve for background activities? So we, so we reserve about uh, half that, uh, half, half the machine's network for, for background activities. And then um, if you wanted to model this more complex, you, you'd have to take into account the consistency level of your writes. So uh, if, you're, if you're sending writes to, um, or sorry, excuse me, you'd have to take into account consistency level of your reads uh, and the replication factor of your writes. Um, but uh, again, in practice, Netflix doesn't really need this complex model. Um, we find the simple model is, is sufficient for, for real Cassandra deployments. All right, so going back to those inputs, uh, we, we have all those as well. We know how big reads and writes are, and we know how many of them are happening. Um, how about disk? So this is where, so disk and RAM is where it starts getting a little bit tricky. Um, so for disk, uh, you have to take into account the replication factor that you'll be storing data at, multiplied by the estimated data size. And then um, we're going to try to find the amount of data that's per zone, because when we're provisioning Cassandra, we usually provision it per uh, you know, availability zone in Amazon or per, um, per data center, um, or excuse me, per rack uh, more, more generally. Um, so whenever you see zones, you can think of rack. So, so the, the amount of data that we have to store per, per zone is the replication factor multiplied by the data size divided by the compression ratio. So if we're getting two to one compression, then we have to store half as much data. Um, and in general, RF and number of zones cancel out. In general, these are the same number. So the amount of data is just the data size divided by the compression. Um, and then uh, I've kind of alighted some details around how much extra space you have to have based on your compaction strategy. Um, but uh, you have to take that into account. And then the uh, final tricky... Uh, thing here is that if you're provisioning cloud drives like EBS GP2, um, it's not enough to know how much disk space you need. You also need to know uh, what kind of read bandwidth you're going to be pulling off of it. Um, and I've just kind of, again, alighted some of the details. But if you're curious about um, the detailed breakdown, I've linked to the code at the bottom, and you can go check out exactly how we take into account um, our read throughput when we're sizing cloud drives. <clears throat> All right, so we've done CPU, network, disk. Um, and disk takes into account more of the inputs than, than the other ones because it's a little more complicated. And now we get to um, the most complicated thing to capacity plan, which is the amount of memory to buy. And the reason why it's complicated is because memory has a fundamental trade-off between um, buying, buying memory to cache reads or buying memory to cache writes. And what I mean by cache writes is in, in Cassandra, we pool up writes in the mem table, and then we flush that out periodically. So you can think of the memory that we're spending on mem tables in heap um, or off heap, in the case of off heap uh, mem tables, we're spending that memory to cache um, writes coming in and to amortize those disk those disk mutations. Um, so, uh, so, so you have to take into account both of those when you're when you're uh, modeling how much RAM you need. Um, and the the read the amount of memory you need for for read is a function of the data size we calculated in the previous uh, slide, and then the working set, which we'll calculate in a second. Working set you can think of as like the percentage of my data that I actually read. Um, so, so if I have like a terabyte of data, but I only actually read 100 gigs, um, you know, what does my working set need to be? And um, as I'll get into in the next slide, we actually calculate the working set a little bit interestingly. Um, we don't base it um, because it's very hard to know what your working set will be, um, but it's easy to uh, figure out what it has to be in order to meet a, um, a read latency SLO. Um, so we'll get into that in the next slides. Um, but I... Uh, Moving on, so we've got the, the RAM that we need to read, and then we've got the RAM that we need to write, and that is a function of our write bandwidth and our compaction strategy. Um, so for example, at Netflix, we try to only recompact data getting flushed out of the mem table twice in an hour. Um, so if we've got like a tiering factor of four, then uh, you can just do some straightforward math and, and calculate like, okay, well, how much memory do I need uh, for mem tables on every node? Um, and the reason that I've just kind of hidden this all behind this F is because this is actually a little bit tricky and very database specific. Um, but if you're curious, again, just look down at the link. And then finally, we have to we have to budget RAM for the amount of JVM heap that we need, which is a function of how much uh, data we're going to be throwing flowing through the heap. So our write bandwidth and our read bandwidth. Um, and then we have to reserve some memory for our system. So if we're running any sidecars like the Apache Cassandra sidecar, or if we're running preem at Netflix, 
Uh, and of course, the kernel needs some memory for like you know socket connections and things like that. So we really need to capacity plan each of these RAM components. And this is tricky because how much RAM we need depends on the number of nodes. And you can kind of intuitively think of that like if I have a cluster that is very wide and, and short. So if I have a lot of nodes that have like a small footprint, um, I'll be spending a lot more memory on JVMs than I will on page cache versus if I do a short and tall configuration, so like two nodes that are very large, then I'll have a lot of memory available for cache, for page cache, and I won't be spending very much on JVM. Um, and if you're curious like how the capacity planner takes that into account, again, just you know check out the code. Um, but essentially we pre-size for CPU network and RAM, and then based on that, we calculate memory. Um, and because memory is the most complicated, it takes into account almost every input that the user gave us. Um, so the only thing that we're not looking at here are you know, read and write on CPU latencies, because those are important um, for this. But we are taking into account like how much data do we have, how much of that do we need, need to be cached. The only thing that I haven't explained so far is that, right, is that um, working set. So how do, we, how do we at Netflix calculate working set? It's a little bit, um, I would say, different. Um, so rather than trying to ask the user, like, you know, what percentage of your data is hot, uh, and needs to be hot. We just ask the user, what's your read latency SLO? And like, what's the promise that you need uh, us to make you about how fast data is accessed? And the reason that we uh, ask that is because that lets us use these disk um, latencies to calculate the working set. So in this case, um, M5D ephemeral drives respond to IOs around 120 microseconds. They're extremely fast. You don't get a lot of benefit out of caching reads coming out of these drives because they're just so, like NVMe flash drives are just so amazingly quick. Um, so you don't need very much RAM to cache reads in front of an ephemeral drive, um, specifically an NVMe ephemeral drive. However, if you're using a cloud drive, like a GP2 drive, then those are an order of magnitude slower. They're a millisecond latency on average. So you're going to need more RAM uh, to cache uh, reads in front of a GP2 drive than you'll need in front of M5Ds. And this is um, one of the things I think a lot of people when they're capacity planning Cassandra on GP2, they don't take into account, like, I have to buy extra RAM in order to compensate for my slow drives. And like there might be reasons to pick GP2 other than latency. Um, or other other than um, performance, but when you're doing capacity planning, you have to take that into account. So um, this slide's a little confusing, but we'll we'll break it down. Um, the way that we determine the working set is we take the drive uh, distribution, which is this red line, um, which remember we got from real data. So like you know this is this is uh, a generative model that uh, we've we've fit using the data, um, and then we uh, say how like how much of the latency promise that we make lies below that drive's 95th percentile. So in this case, the EBS drive's 95th percentile latency is 1.35 milliseconds. And then the blue line here is the promise that we make to local quorum users, um, which is essentially uh, that they'll, their reads will happen in single digit milliseconds spread um, with, a, with a bias towards around two milliseconds. Um, so this blue line here is the promise that we make database um, local quorum users. Now contrast this with the promise in orange, which is the, the promise that we make to like memcache users or, or local one um, people who are using Cassandra as, like a, as a caching data set. We make a much more aggressive latency promise. And so we can see that um, for the database promise, for the two millisecond promise, um, about 46% of the latency SLO is faster than the drive can provide. Um, so that's how much memory we need. We need at least 46% of the data always hot in cache um, uh, under the assumption that um, we will be receiving reads against that data. Versus in the cache, 99%. Uh, in order to achieve that kind of latency distribution with, with GP2, um, we need almost 99% of our data footprint held in cache. Now contrast this with ephemeral drive. So the red line here is the ephemeral drive latency. And you'll notice on the x-axis, we've shifted down into the 100 microsecond um, range. So we don't make very many promises in the 100 microsecond range. Um, so even with the aggressive cache SLO, only about 2% needs to be held in memory. And in fact, at Netflix, um, we serve some of our biggest caching workloads out of memcache that is backed by ephemeral drives, um, not that's backed by memory, primarily. Uh, and close to 0% of the database SLO uh, lies, lies below an NVMe drive's 95th percentile. Um, so this is how we calculate working set, which is a little bit unintuitive because um, uh, you know, it's, it's basically saying, how much memory do I, do I need to buy in order to deal with my drive being slow? rather than uh, thinking of it more traditionally. All right, so great success. Um, we can compute a cluster for a given input. Um, 
but we have dozens of hardware inputs. We have different kinds of hardware types. We have different kinds of cloud drives. Okay, well, we can solve that pretty straightforwardly. All we have to do is just run a for loop um, for every type of hardware. We uh, feed that into our model and we see how many instances we need. Um, and uh, the way that you get the number of instances is, is all of those uh, requirements that we talked about earlier, the number of CPUs, the amount of RAM, the amount of disk, just take that and divide it by the amount of CPU, RAM, and disk that a particular instance gives you, um, applying some max functions. Um, so here we can say, like, if we feed into the model M5 2x large instance types, then we'll say, okay, we need 12 M5 2s with 200 gigabytes of GPU attached. Um, or if we feed in these other instances, and then each one of these configurations satisfies the requirement and costs a certain amount of money. So we just pick the cheapest one. Um, and you can kind of intuitively think of this like, uh, we're going to pick whichever hardware configuration buys the things we need. So buys CPU, buys network, buys drives, buys disk space, um, buys memory. Uh, we're gonna pick whichever instance shape in our cloud, in our cloud environment um, buys that resource the most efficiently. So great success. We can compute a cluster um, over all possible inputs. Uh, this is wonderful, we're very exciting. Uh, um, except that then we remember that our inputs are distributions. So everything we just talked about was assuming that we knew for sure how much reads or writes or how long those things will take. But we actually have like 20 input parameters and they're all you know different, these distributions over, over ranges. Um, so uh, to take it to 11, uh, at Netflix, we, we apply Monte Carlo here. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with Monte Carlo simulation, um, it's uh, about the most straightforward randomized algorithm you can think of. It's simulate a bunch of possible worlds um, and then make a choice um, based on the outcomes. So uh, instead of picking a particular world and saying, this is the world we live in, we're going to simulate a bunch of possible worlds that we could end up in. And then we're going to have a uh, model of regret. And uh, that's kind of the, the, the final algorithm, the, the final capacity planner, is we simulate all these possible worlds, um, and we're really just interested in getting some tail events. So we don't need to simulate the world that will actually happen. Um, we just need, yeah, financial planning, that's right. Um, we just need to uh, get some tail events in there. So, so like when we looked at those distributions earlier, we saw that we had like this long tail of like every now and again, we might need a lot, of, a lot more disk than, than we thought we would need. Um, and we're just interested in generating those tail events. We're not we're not interested in generating the world as it will be, um, because once we've generated all of these different worlds and run the the planner through them, we are going to pick the choice that we least regret across all worlds. Um, so what does that mean? Uh, the we're, we're going to pick the cluster that makes us the least sad uh, overall. And uh, at Netflix, uh, we regret um, kind of two main. Uh, parameters in, in our clusters. Uh, and you can kind of think of it like the regret between two clusters, the regret between cluster that we generated in world X and the cluster that we generated in world Y is equal to some uh, regret parameter K multiplied by the difference in the cost, so in the money that we spent. Um, and we, re we regret both spending too much money or too little money. So you can think of it like um, assuming that Amazon or Google are, are appropriately pricing their resources, um, money is actually a really good way, like a really good single number that indicates like, is this a lot of compute or a little compute? Um, so if we're in worlds where we bought too little computer and we needed more, then we're under-provisioned. If we're in a world where we bought too much computer and we needed less, then we're over-provisioned. Um, and, then, and then we asymmetrically regret disk. So we only regret not having enough disk. And this is actually uh, pluggable. Um, if you look at the library, um, you can bring you know any any attribute of regret that you want. Uh, but we we actually find in Netflix that just cost and disk space, or or in the case of in memory data stores, cost and, and memory um, are pretty sufficient. So let's work. At, this this seems kind of abstract and a little hard to. So let, let's work an example. Um, let's say we've got two worlds. So in world one, um, whatever inputs happen in world one. We ended up buying 48 i3 ENX large instances that cost us $73,000. And in world two, we ended up buying 96 R5 8x larges that cost us half a million dollars, um, along with their associated disk requirements. So we can think of regret uh, in both directions. So let's say that we're, we bought world one's computer, but we live in world two. Um, so we should have bought this cluster, but we bought this cluster instead. Um, and then we can just uh, work out the regret. And it turns out that the first component kind of dominates disk space uh, regret. Um, <clears throat> but in general, we regret this choice in that world about the cost of $10 million. 
Um, but then we can run the, the numbers the other way around, uh, this time changing the, the constant factor for under provisioning. So, so in this, in this case, um, we under provisioned, we bought two little computers for what actually happened. Um, but in, uh, the, the flip side were over provisioned. We bought too much computers. We overspent money and we have too much disk. So because we don't regret having too much disk, um, disk regret was zero, but we do regret spending too much money. Um, so we have about $8 million of regret there. Um, and so you can kind of see how we can do this pairwise calculation for every possible world, and then we can make the choice, which is the least regretful across all possible worlds. Um, and that choice of constants, so that choice of like, how much do we care about over-provisioning versus under-provisioning? How much do we care about disk versus dollars versus memory? Um, those, those parameters, which are tunable, uh, they provide your company's personal risk profile towards under-provisioning versus over-provisioning. Um, so at Netflix, in general, we're biased towards over-provisioning. We would rather spend money and have fewer outages. Um, and so the, the parameter choice that we've made um, uh, uh, kind of fits for that. Um, all right, so let's work a couple of examples. Um, let's work a couple of examples with uh, the least regret optimizer. So again, we're gonna go back to that 10,000 reads and writes and 100 gigs of state. Um, we're gonna run it through the capacity planner using the Netflix Cassandra model. We're gonna run 1,024 a, a worlds. Um, and then the, the regret optimizer spits out this. So our least regretful choice is gonna be 12 M5Ds costing about $9,000. And um, we can we can see all the possibilities that happen. So in some worlds, we bought these little itty bitty R5 clusters. In some, in one world, in in one of the worlds, we bought this massive you know M5X large cluster. Um, but over all worlds, the least regretful choice um, is picking a 12 M5D X large. All right. So let's actually zoom in and and look a little bit at. Um, let's see. Do I have time? Yeah, I've got good time. All right, so let's let's zoom in and, and let's actually look at what were the sampled inputs in those worlds. So in the world where we picked the 12 M5D cluster, um, these red lines here uh, show our, so we had slightly above average um, reads and slightly above average size, and we had about average everything else. Um, and, and I just want to, you know, and, and this is what I meant earlier about like, we don't actually need the world, we just need to bias towards the tail events. And, and we'll look at those one of those tail events in a second. Um, but we have effectively biased towards the tail events. Uh, we've biased towards uh, having a little bit more capacity for reads, a little more capacity for disk uh, than we would have normally. Um, and, and let's look at, at one of those biasing tail events. Uh, so this is the highest regret world. This is that 196M5X large that we saw at the end. Uh, it's $62,000. It's extremely over-provisioned. It's very regretful in general. Um, but it did uh, end up with two uh, tail events. So, um, and this, you can kind of think of this tail event as um, the world that happened was a lot more reads than average, and those reads were very expensive. So we had to go off and buy a ton of CPUs, um, which is why we ended up with 96 M5X larges uh, to deal with this. So um, just to kind of reiterate, we're never going to pick the tail event clusters because in most worlds, they're very regretful. In most worlds that we encounter, um, we spend a bunch of money for things that we don't need, but they do serve to kind of pull up the regret um, the, the choice away from the average towards those tail events. Um, and they do so going through that like super nonlinear model function. Um, so now let's look at another extremely regretful world, um, but one where we spent very little money. So this is a world where we bought six R5DX large, larges and we spent $2,000. This is in general very under-provisioned, which is why um, we would <coughs> um, generally never pick this, this capacity uh, choice. Uh, and just to kind of zoom in, in particular, the tail event that happened here that um, we're just never gonna really consider is like there were two reads. So they told us they were gonna do 10,000 reads per second and they ended up doing like four or, or five or something, um, which I mean, certainly for any of you who have run clusters in, in, in anger, um, sometimes users say, I'm gonna do this and then they end up doing nothing close to that. Um, and it's important for our model to capture that. Um, but again, we're never going to buy these computers. We're just going to use them to bias the, uh, the least regret choice. All right, and we can work another example. So in this case, we have uh, 10 terabytes of data that we want to store, and we have uh, 100,000 writes per second. And um, the reason I want to do this real quick is because I think it shows diversity in, in world generation. Um, so because we've now made our inputs much, much wider, so instead of kind of being narrow scopes, um, we have like, you know, between, um, between 10,000 and 100,000 reads, and between 100,000 and a million writes, um, there, you know, there's a lot of diversity. In input, 
Um, our least regretful choice for this particular requirement is 48 i3 ENX large uh, computers costing around $73,000 a year. <clears throat> Um, and we still ended up picking that exact hardware configuration in 165 out of 1,024 worlds. Um, and you can also think of like the least regret optimizer as because regret between a world where you picked the same hardware, because the regret is essentially zero in that case, um, you do bias towards modal clusters as well. Um, so, so like we can see this here. Um, this is certainly multimodal. So, you know, some. There are some modes over in you know different sizes of i3 i3 en instances, um, and I think there's even like a small mode in M5s plus EBS. Uh, yeah, so like there's this small mode here where you attach a bunch of EBS to M5x larges, um, but I. Uh, depending on where exactly we landed in those inputs, we're, we're going to generate a lot of a lot of the possible outputs, and that's really I think the power of the least regret optimizer is that um, you know we can kind of uh, deal with a lot of these possible tail events without, um, like, while still buying something that's pretty good in general and not costing us too much money. And just, you know, zooming in on those worlds, uh, you know, uh, for the least regret, we have right spot on the number of writes, slightly more disk space than, than expected. Um, 73,000, we have a good amount of disk, we have a good amount of CPU. Um, we're, we're generally well positioned for uh, any world. Uh, even if we ended up in in this you know crazy world where we had to go buy 96 R586 larges with 1.2 terabytes of GP2 attached, costing you know $640,000, um, which in general is very regretful. In general, this is way too much money to spend on a cluster. Um, but and, and in this case, we actually had three tail events. Um, so we had a tail event in our data size. Um, we had a tail event in how expensive reads are, and we had a lot of reads. So we needed a lot of CPU. We needed a lot of RAM. Um, and because we we're doing a lot of reads, we need a lot of RAM to cache reads. Um, so, so this kind of uh, example, I think, illustrates the we don't need the world that will happen. We just need the tail events to happen. Um, all right. So uh, we've gone over how to do all this, uh, you know, how to how to kind of mathematically calculate clusters across all possible inputs, um, and at a scale that, like, I mean, you know, just to, previous to the system, you know, humans at Netflix would do this, and and like we can just have sympathy. Like, it's so hard. To understand all the different kinds of shapes and all the impacts on like read caching versus write caching versus like do you want heap or do you want page cache like like this is extremely complicated it's hard it's hard for a human to do this reliably which is why I think you know we might gravitate towards things like well just you know just just pick the database class instance and just like you know if if we're at a capacity to just you know make more of those um, but as we've seen uh, in this in the presentation the difference in cost between picking the optimal cluster and picking you know the database class cluster can be hundreds of thousands of dollars um, so we, we definitely want to make sure that we're making the right choice um, but how do we how do we continue to make sure we've made the right choice <clears throat> Uh, so the good thing about all of the inputs that we've talked about today is they're mostly measurable. Um, so for example, uh, you can actually measure what percentage of your requests are queuing. Um, so you can measure, do you have enough CPUs uh, by, by reading one number out of proc sketched at. Um, so, so down here, I've, I've kind of screenshotted how you collect this information. Um, and then this is an example of a tier zero cluster where remember tier zeros, we're paying a lot of money so that we never queue. Um, and this this metric is literally measuring how many requests show up and then queue. Um, I guess technically it's not requests queuing; it's just any work on the CPU queuing. Um, but but if you have a latency sensitive tier zero, you want this number to be zero. Um, and and sure enough, like on this particular tier zero cluster, zero percent of uh, runnable threads ever wait to run on a CPU. Um, versus like a tier two throughput oriented cluster, you know we're up around maybe eighteen percent queuing time. Um, and uh, so you can just measure, like, you know, are we getting the right amount of queuing? This also very nicely answers, if I were to add more additional CPUs, would it help me? Um, so we actually use this back when uh, the, the Spectre Meltdown uh, um, Spectre Meltdown attacks came out and like all of our CPUs across EC2 like instantly got slower. Um, and there was a lot of like, you know, well, can we recover from this latency by buying more CPUs? And if this number was 0%, uh, there's no recovering from that latency hit. Um, because like the requests have just gotten slower. There's no there's no way to make them faster by getting more capacity. Um, versus in this world, uh, in in this case, we could make things faster by buying more CPUs because then our our threads wouldn't have to wait to run. 
Um, disk and network are much simpler. Um, basic utilization metrics suffice. Um, you can measure how much disk space you're using and, and how much uh, you know bandwidth. And this is um, when I mentioned earlier that burst throughput is useful. Like this, this is an hourly um, incremental backup. Um, and, and you can kind of see, or I guess an hourly partial snapshot backup. Um, and you can see that like that having that burst credit available is useful for things like backups, but you want a capacity plan, you know, for, for this baseline. Um, RAM is, is again, the most tricky. Uh, so we've got kind of two ways of measuring. We can measure uh, page cache, uh, and you, we mostly do that using read IO metrics. So like how many reads are hitting the drive. Um, if you're if you're really fancy, you can use something like BPF, like cache stat, um, which actually measures how many reads are hitting the page cache in Linux. Um, we we don't get that fancy. Um, we we usually just measure read IOs. Um, the JVM and write buffer is much easier to tell if you've sized correctly because uh, if you're if you're doing a major garbage collection in Java more often than every ten minutes in Cassandra, then you probably don't have enough heap. Um, and if you are flushing to disk more often than every like four or five minutes, then you probably don't have enough of that write buffer in the heap, um, which means that you need to like increase the amount of memory available to mem tables or uh, buy more heap. So so buy more instances that then give you more heaps. Um, so yeah, I mean uh, JVM and, and write buffer are easy. Page cache is a little bit trickier, but again, you can kind of measure. Um, and with that. Uh, you know, you can kind of develop a very simple algorithm for monitoring your choices. Just buy more of whatever you ran out of. Um, so, like in Netflix, you can like if you end up on M5 instances, which are uh, kind of general purpose instances, uh, and you need to buy more memory, um, you can usually just switch over to R5s. Um, or if you need more network, you can go to the N flavor. Most cloud providers offer these kinds of different shapes that optimize for one of the resources, and usually you're only running out of one. If you're running out of like multiple, you know, you just have to scale up. You have to double, or or if you're using virtual nodes, you can. Um, yeah, I should probably say that. So the the Netflix Cassandra model does doubling because we we still do single tokens. But um, you know, if if you if you had virtual nodes, then you could incrementally scale. You wouldn't have to have those like you know uh, forty eight node clusters or ninety six node. All right, so that's really um, I hope pretty straightforward. Uh, you know, in conclusion, today we've we've seen how to understand our hardware, how to you know actually record the details of uh, you know how they they function in the real world. Um, then we've seen how to use some queuing theory and and some light uh, capacity planning um, to to simulate. Um, or sorry, to compute clusters given inputs. And then uh, we've seen a, a technique using Monte Carlo simulation um, and least regret optimization to pick the cluster that we will actually provision in the real world. Um, and then finally, we've wrapped it up with monitoring our choices um, and how we know if we bought enough of the various uh, resources. Because remember that, that today we've only solved the problem of, of my user has this uncertain input and they want us to go buy some computers. Um, there's a different problem of you know, now that the 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 input has been revealed, so we actually know what's going on. Um, did we buy the right thing? And that's a, a totally separate problem to uh, to the kind of uncertain capacity planning problem. All right, and with that, I've um, got a couple minutes left here, um, but I want to open it up for questions. Um, and I'm also happy to to chat more afterwards on um, Apache Slack or anywhere. Thank you all. All right, uh, let's see. Looking in the chat. Um, all right. Uh, how many Cassandra clusters do you have in production system? Um, we run hundreds to thousands of clusters um, because I, we generally try to keep database clusters one to one with applications. Um, we like to create fault, fault boundaries that that go like all the way down. Um, so so the service the service should should fail like like if a database fails, it should only bring down its service. It shouldn't bring down all of Netflix. Um, so we're at, we we generally shun multi-tenant data stores. Um, I hope that answers the question, Bowen. All right. Any other questions? Let's see. Um, am I a producer of Netflix serials? Um, no. Um, how long did it take you to figure this out? Um, the the about the past year. Um, we've been. Uh, you know, I, I can kind of point to everything, which like, which now like going over in the talk, it's like, oh, well, that's obvious. But, um, uh, but um, like for example, it took us a little while to figure out how do we go from like um, point statistics. Um, so someone's getting like a 90th percentile on average. How do we go from that to like a generative beta distribution? Um, uh, it took us a little while to figure out. Um, you know, how do we? Uh, I mean, it took us a little while just to to figure out the inputs. 
um, because like all of the open source data that's available is just like not accurate. So so if you capacity plan based on it, you're gonna just end up with completely the wrong things. Um, but yeah, it took us about a year, Stefan. Have you tried applying the same technique to future growth from a baseline? Um, so we haven't, um, although I think, uh, so every all of the inputs that we talked about today are measurable. So like you can measure how many reads you're doing, you can measure how many writes you're doing. Um, Cassandra emits all these metrics. Um, so uh, you can uh, you, you can you can uh, capacity plan for a future requirement with that. Um, all right, how much cost savings did you get after starting to use these? Um, I can't tell you exactly, Raymond. Um, one, because I don't know, and two, because even if I didn't know, I, I probably couldn't say that publicly. Um, but it it is, um, it's 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 uh, made it so that we can self-service Cassandra clusters. So we don't have to um, involve the capacity planning team on every, on every single cluster creation. Um, all right, uh, have you thought about bare metal servers? We found they're much cheaper than cloud in terms of CPU and RAM. Um, so uh, you know Netflix really really likes uh, using Amazon. We're we're, we're really good um, partners with AWS. Um, so I don't think that we'll be migrating off. But the the service capacity planning um, models, um, the, you know, it just operates on hardware shapes. Um, so uh, and, and if you go look at the repo, like you could con you could bring your own shapes, which are based on the bare metal servers that you have, or if you like, you know, slice up those servers into VMs or 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 containers or or what have you. Um, you know, you, you can you can use this system to do bare metal provisioning. Um, it also, you know, is cloud agnostic. So, uh, if if you're on Google Compute or 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 uh, Azure, um, as long as you can describe your hardware, um, then you can you can do it. All right, I think I think we're just we're either at time or, or uh, are we at time? Yes. Yeah, so the next the next talk is starting now. Um, thank you all. I I, um, I I can stick around and. and uh, answer some more questions if anybody has them. But um, I'm also happy to chat on Slack or, or offline.